We begin this morning with outrage over President Trump once again blaming both sides for the deadly violence in Charlottesville. Both Republicans and Democrats denounced the president's remarks. Senator John McCain tweeted, there's no moral equivalency between racists and Americans standing up to defy hate and bigotry. The president did receive approval from former KKK leader David Duke, who thanked him for standing up to, quote, leftist terrorists. Margaret Brennan has more. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it. And In a tense exchange with me. reporters, a frustrated oh, President Trump lashed out, doubling down on his initial equivocal statement that both sides were to blame for Charlottesville violence. You had a group on one side that was bad, and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. And nobody wants to say that. Growing increasingly combative with the press, Mr. Trump appeared to defend the white nationalist groups that organized the Unite the Right rally. I've condemned neo-Nazis. I've condemned many different groups, but not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists. The president said the dispute centered on the removal of a Confederate statute. So this week it's Robert E. Lee, I noticed that Stonewall Jackson's coming down. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? And is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? But the president's frustration broke through when we asked about Republican Senator John McCain's call for him to denounce attacks by the alt-right on White House staff. You mean Senator McCain who voted against us getting good health care? And he went on to say those on the far left and the alt-right are equally at fault. Senator McCain defined them as the same group. Okay, what about the alt-left that came charging him? Excuse me. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? As the president spoke, his new chief of staff, John Kelly, the man charged with bringing command and control to the White House, stood to the side with his head down. The limits to Kelly's ability to keep the president on message were laid bare as Mr. Trump defended his original statement on Saturday's rally. In fact, I brought it. I brought it. Which avoided condemning the white supremacist groups who invoked his name. The first statement was a fine statement, but you don't make statements that direct unless you know the fact. He condemned the driver who rammed his car into counter protesters and killed 32-year-old Heather Heyer. You can call it terrorism. You can call it murder. You can call it whatever you want. The driver of the car is a murderer. And what he did was a horrible, horrible, inexcusable thing. CBS News White House correspondent Margaret Brennan is here with us now. Margaret, this was a bizarre news conference. Uh, we saw you in your piece there having a heated exchange with the president of the United States uh, and other journalists. Take us through what happened and how things escalated. Well, it, it was not even meant to be a tense exchange. I was just trying to ask the president about what Senator McCain had said, and, and this is where you really saw the frustration and the anger that the president had about all the coverage of this rally, because the mere mention of John McCain's name, he started cutting me off and challenging, and I was just trying to ask a, a question, not challenge the president. That's not our role to debate him, and I strongly believe that. Um, but it, it was a really, interesting moment that took on a life of its own because we were told to be in in the lobby for scripted remarks on infrastructure this is the president's legislative agenda this is a campaign item he promised and he was going to unveil and say he was delivering on and he had people of real stature and importance by his side gary Cohn, uh, the national economic director the secretary of Tra transportation elaine chow the treasury secretary all with him and they stood there as this went off the rails and went into a completely different different topic. Um, and the president, as you saw, was obviously deeply frustrated and really wanted to unload. And it was an incredible moment. It, and it was shocking because it got so off the rails. Mm -hmm. And uh, all these cabinet members are standing there sort of stoically, but also nervously. You could see that on their faces. Mm -hmm. You saw when the president was asked about racism and he said, well, jobs, jobs is what we need. And, you know, the problem with race in, in this country will be solved by jobs. And we saw the reaction on Twitter from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. A lot of Republicans speaking out, a handful naming the president directly. Um, and you wonder if he thinks jobs that's going to be the answer to the problems here. How is he going to get any of his agenda done when 
clearly he's upsetting a lot of people within his own party and we know that he's attacked some of the, his critics within his own party. Mm -hmm. Well, I, some of this may be people speaking past each other because clearly, yes, there is an issue in certain parts of this country with underemployment and, and issues that the president campaigned on when he went to those areas promising jobs. But things may mean, have different um, meanings yeah. where he's delivering that message. And in some of these cases, as we saw from the people who were at that rally on Saturday, they hear these things in a completely different context where it is associated with race or you know some sort of um, unequal treatment on the basis of racial lines rather than simply the economic so it, it, it's it's interesting with the president because he so strongly believes that he has the answer and if everyone just listened and followed we'd get there right. and he did, didn't seem in that moment to be um, understanding why so many of his aides had pushed him to make those scripted remarks, to calm the waters, to put this uh, past him and, and to focus again on his agenda. He didn't see that, you could tell, as turning the page. He saw that as a challenge to him, but which is why he hit back and defended himself, it seemed. Doesn't he need these congressional lawmakers yes. to get his agenda no, done? You're, if you're it's exactly jobs, right. then doesn't he need them? And he's upsetting them. Well, you're right. All these uh, congressional leaders who came out, uh, Paul Ryan, others who really saw the um, that this is a dangerous topic to go off script with because it can get so heated. This isn't something you riff on. There's a reason why you need to be very careful with your words on this topic in particular. Um, but uh, to your point, Elaine Chao, the transportation, transportation secretary, is married to the, the Senate Majority Leader right. Mitch McConnell. Right. She's in an interesting spot because the president has directly and publicly attacked her husband. Um, so she's working for the president while he attacks her husband. And she very diplomatically said, uh, I stand by both my men mm. in, when she was asked what about that. So it's, it's a very, um, look, the president wanted to be disruptive. He's certainly been that, but it's a question of whether he's defeating his own agenda by going this way. Yeah. Uh, Margaret, there was another moment that a lot of people found surreal. It was, there were questions directed to the president with regards to the young lady, Heather Heyer, who died uh, yes. in the exchange uh, over the weekend. And he was asked if he had spoken to her. And the president went on some discussion about how her mother said very nice things about him, sort of patting himself on the back because the mother of Heather Heyer had said some things uh, that were favorable to the president. And then, as reporters tried to get a response to whether or not he was going to call her family, he talked about owning a winery in Charlottesville yeah. and that he has a house there and have yeah. you visited it? It's the biggest winery. In I mean, what was the reaction there from other reporters and how do you think that that plays to just Americans who look to the president for moral leadership? Well, the president seemed to be responding in a personal way and making that about him saying that you know the mother of this victim had issued a statement and she shared it with CBS saying thank you for denouncing mm -hmm. um, this kind of violence and race-based violence something that her daughter had been there to march against and you would expect um, it's sort of standard that a president would have reached out to the family of these victims or perhaps visited the location where something um, like this happened to, to unify people. Uh, that's certainly something that President Obama had to do because he did also on his watch have many of these racially fueled moments. But that wasn't the script. Uh, and again, the president has said again and again and campaigned on being disruptive. But there are certain moments where you do expect the office itself to have a certain moral authority and to bring it there on, on issues that can be so inflammatory and dangerous. So it was shocking because we asked again and again, are you going to go to Charlottesville? Right. Are you going to go to Charlottesville? And he didn't answer that, but he talked about how it was the biggest vineyard in America. I don't know if that's the case or not, but, mm -hmm. but he went there right. mm -hmm. um, rather than you know, he did say it's a wonderful place that has been through something strange, but went to his business and his property. And it seems like that's where the president is comfortable and in these uncomfortable moments yeah. is going back to his talking points, his personal place and his role as he identifies himself, not as with the role that so many identify the presidency with. And I know we have to wrap this up, but you just said something that's interesting, talking points. There was a, a memo that was released. A lot of right. people have been yes. asking you, I think, asked Sean Dickerson, what are members of the administration going to do now in the wake of this press conference? Are they going to continue to stand by the president? There was a talking point uh, memo that Major Garrett sent out that said, essentially, the staff is saying the president was correct. Right. Yes. Well, look, this is 
the White House aides were not prepared for this moment. We were told five minute statement and the president's going to walk away. Uh, that's obviously not what happened, but they went quickly on the defensive to protect him, um, putting out these talking points to White House allies, asking them to to emphasize, look, focus on what the president did say. He did say it was a horrible, mm. horrible day. He did say this was murder, maybe terrorism. He did say a lot of the things that they had urged him to say, but the problem is everything else mm -hmm. that he added in and ad-libbed. And so these talking points are trying to get people to focus on some of that rather than the equivalency, but also to make that argument that there is a, a moral equivalency between sometimes violent groups on the left and these groups that were associated with this rally who have a history, some of them neo-Nazis, some of them KKK, but as the president said, and this is where he got into dangerous territory, some of them are very nice people. Right. Margaret Brennan, thank you. Thank you, Margaret.